Uh, I'm Sanjay. Uh, I work at Intel, and um, another uh, at Intel, I uh, constantly think around like you know how we can uh, contribute to Ethereum, uh, and I'm one of the co-chairs at uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and uh, uh, as part of that, we released uh, the client spec, which uh, uh, you know requirements for enterprise clients, uh, uh, you know uh, enterprise Ethereum clients, as well as uh, uh, for uh, scalability and things uh, and privacy, which are very important in that space, uh, we are exploring various solutions. And uh, one of the solutions that uh, we are exploring is around trusted compute. And uh, uh, we, I believe, have the EEA has released uh, an early version of that spec. And uh, we just want to uh, today introduce that briefly and then also give a perspective on uh, uh, the work that's happening in the ecosystem by various partners on using trusted compute. Uh, so that like, you know, connecting the dots for people, uh, uh, you know, between uh, what is trusted compute and what kind of things it's being used for. So we have a packed session, roughly six presentations and a, and a panel. And uh, uh, hopefully it will be fun uh, as we go through this. So, so uh, as I said, I will just uh, talk about uh, uh, the work that we have done briefly, and then uh, uh, you know call other uh, presenters so one by one. So, like, uh, uh, so, so just uh, brief, uh, you know, what is enterprise Ethereum? Uh, in case uh, people here are uh, not uh, up to it, uh, enterprise Ethereum was uh, uh, a year plus ago. Several of us got together, and we realized that you know uh, there are a lot of demand from enterprises uh, using Ethereum-based uh, uh, you know blockchain uh, for for enterprise applications. Uh, there were several clients, and uh, what we were seeing is like some kind of fragmentation and uh, things like that, and uh, uh, not a, not a cohesive way to address uh, enterprise requirements. So that's why this enterprise uh, uh, alliance came came about. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and I don't know why I kept that. I thought. So uh, 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 early morning. Uh, so, uh, uh, so the thing is, like, you know, there are four things about this enterprise uh, uh, alliance, really, is that uh, one is uh, defining uh, standards around, like, you know, how enterprise clients, uh, you know, work, interoperate, and things like that. Uh, address specifically some of the requirements of enterprise clients, and I will talk about them in the next slide. Uh, uh, we uh, want to leverage, build upon uh, all the work that is happening within public Ethereum on scalability, privacy, and uh, uh, you know, uh, embrace all of that and extend that. And uh, we'll talk briefly about that. And finally, you know, uh, uh, create interoperability. Uh, and certification at all places where it makes sense. So, so with that quick overview of that, uh, when we talk about enterprise uh, uh, Ethereum, uh, there, there are several, uh, uh, call it challenges, call it requirements. Um, uh, privacy uh, uh, is very important in the sense that uh, you might have, you know, four, as an example, participating banks uh, on a on same chain, but the transactions between two banks don't need to be disclosed to other two banks. Uh, so that's a requirement. A scalability, uh, more, much more than you know, uh, uh, just the sheer amount of transactions. We need higher scalability, and uh, uh, 15 transactions doesn't do it for us, or 10 transactions. Uh, but you know, we are trying to do our work and build upon whatever uh, the uh, foundation does. And permissioning, in the sense that uh, being in an enterprise network, there is this requirement in the sense like uh, uh, we see hybrid networks in the sense that there are certain actors that will be permissioned and uh, have roles in terms of uh, maybe there are certain subsets who can deploy smart contracts. There are certain subsets who can uh, you know, uh, initiate certain transactions. But then uh, there are, uh, in case of hybrid networks, we do see like, you know, certain uh, people from the public side of the world interacting with this. So we have this uh, to figure out what, uh, what the identities are and how, uh, how they you know, are enrolled into the system. 
the other part of it is like uh, 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 interacting with the external world. In the sense, to initiate transactions, you have to make sure that your uh, wallet or the, uh, the keys that are used to uh, generate transactions are very protected uh, uh, from the enterprise perspective, because you are basically representing someone when you are uh, initiating a transaction. Uh, and then uh, uh, other aspect of the uh, connecting to the outside world is, uh, you know, bringing information from uh, uh, from various oracles into the system, uh, be it price of a commodity or, uh, you know, uh, weather in certain place, uh, whatever that might be. So how do we bring all of that in, in a, trusted, a trusted way into this, uh, uh, in, in, into the implementation, into the deployments? So. Uh, so uh, scalability, right? Uh, uh, you guys probably have heard all of these things, so I'm not going to repeat. Uh, uh, so the point really here is that uh, we are, uh, you know, going to use uh, these. Uh, you know, are very excited to see this uh, uh, Ethereum 2.0 or Serenity, uh, as Vitalik talked about it yesterday, mm, and. Uh, uh, so wherever uh, we can use the beacon chain is very exciting. Uh, so we will use these uh, sharding plasma where, when they become more, uh, you know, robust defined uh, where possible. And uh, uh, but what we are saying really is that uh, we have defined another one based on a trusted compute that uh, that we are working through, and uh, and that's what we're trying to connect here with the uh, rest of the uh, rest of the foundation. Uh, so, like, uh, so, so a little bit about uh, uh, trusted compute so to level set, uh, 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 you know, what what it is, uh, uh, because like uh, at least in my experience, uh, uh, many people have different notions of what trusted compute is. So I'll tell you my definition based on which, you know, at least uh, I have been working. It, it's really a, a place, uh, what we say is where you can uh, execute a piece of software uh, without any external uh, uh, influence, interference. Uh, so what that means is like you can divide a system, be it a PC or a server, into a trusted part and an untrusted part. So in this picture, the uh, trusted part is in the blue, and uh, uh, and uh, around it the white is the untrusted part. So, so what we are saying is that if there is something executing inside that blue, uh, uh, it, it it is integrity protective. Meaning, meaning, like you know, if you do one plus one inside that blue, you know exactly one plus one happened. Uh, why? Because uh, the underlying system is giving you those guarantees. The other aspect of it is like if you have any keys in there. Uh, you can pretty much be sure, even if you may have malware running in the white part, the untrusted part, your uh, keys will be protected and cannot be, uh, you know, uh, uh, stolen. Uh, and as a result, if there is any data that is sent encrypted into this blue box from outside, uh, it cannot be, uh, uh, you know, decrypted outside. Uh, yes, you can do DOS attacks in the sense like you can drop the packets and things like that, but you cannot fake the. Uh, uh, fake it into thinking thinking otherwise. And the uh, last thing uh, about this uh, container is that uh, uh, you, you know you get an uh, attestation at the end of it what what has happened, what code I executed, what uh, uh, inputs I got, and what are my outputs. So you get that kind of a uh, you know response. So. It, uh, there are various types of trusted compute that are comprehended in the spec. One is uh, trusted computes like Intel SGX, and uh, then there are other uh, ones too, like uh, software based based on uh, zk proofs, MPC. Uh, so in the spec that uh, I will share in a little bit, uh, uh, these we are comprehending uh, all of these because we do believe that it's not uh, one thing is not a silver bullet to it. Uh, there will be situations wherein uh, you may even have to have a heterogeneous deployment where in a single deployment you use MPC for certain things, trusted compute for something else, and uh, so we are comprehending all those uh, uh, permutation combinations. Um, so just a quick uh, uh, perspective on like, you know, uh, how uh, about the ecosystem of the, 
uh, about the e ecosystem of the uh, uh, around trusted compute. So uh, generally, the, what I want to say here is like uh, it's been fairly active. Uh, lots of people have uh, been working on uh, in this space, and uh, uh, several of uh, them you will see talk about uh, in, uh, in uh, right after uh, I'm done. Uh, so a slide on uh, our trusted compute. So it was a very interesting experience uh, uh, within the forum going through this because uh, we we got to know several perspectives of the people, and uh, the idea of this one was to put it out, uh, say that trusted compute really is uh, use it in the sense like you know you are off chaining, you have the chain, and you are going to off chain and take the uh, take uh, computation off the chain, be it for scalability because the uh, task is uh, complex or be, or you have some private data that you cannot share on the chain and you do all of that processing uh, inside trusted compute uh, so uh, so we had several objectives in terms of um, private transactions I gave an example of that you know four banks uh, in, uh, in a console, in, on a chain two are doing transaction the other two should not know so that's one example uh, the other one is uh, like you know uh, two banks have data sets that they both want to combine and uh, derive some inference from that, but they don't want to uh, give up the control or uh, really uh, or uh, you know keep the confidentiality of the data that they have. So you could uh, you know use trusted compute in that setting. The other uh, so these are the two that we have to some extent comprehended in the current version. Uh, the work that we have to do is around. Um, the foundation is, uh, you know, will support this attested oracles, but we have to do that, and that's in the upcoming versions we will address that. Uh, we are also looked uh, at identities, and uh, uh, besides, we had a good conversation around should it be uh, identities based on uh, uh, just the Ethereum addresses, or should it be decentralized identities as defined by a decentralized identity foundation. So generally, uh, we are going to uh, explore that. We are supporting uh, what DID work is being done uh, in the industry. So more, uh, uh, you know, uh, discussion on that will be upcoming. And then the other one is uh, this. Uh, this version, if you look at the spec, you can see that some of the APIs are not something that you would use them on public Ethereum because they do consume high gas, and that's our one of our. Uh, upcoming objectives in the next version is to actually go through those and uh, clean up and uh, uh, have them aligned with what is expected on, on the public Ethereum side. Uh, and the other side of the APIs is we are uh, making sure that it doesn't design anyone out, uh, be, it, be it different implementations of trusted compute, uh, you know, TE or different implementations of uh, uh, ZK, so we're uh, trying to do, uh, that's definitely uh, one of our objectives, and also to comprehend uh, all the three forms. Uh, so uh, so this spec was actually, uh, you know, early version point five version of the spec was uh, uh, announced uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, uh, we do, uh, you know, our uh, hope is that you guys will go check it out from your perspective, uh, and uh, Provide feedback uh, into the spec. Uh, uh, our uh, our desire or our objective is uh, the version 0.5 that we uh, uh, announced like this week. Uh, we will take it to 1.0 uh, by uh, you know Q2 of next year when there uh, when there will be a next uh, uh, update of the spec, uh, as well as work on some other f new features that we have you know not really had time to uh, explore. Um, so, so that, that's what I was trying to uh, hopefully give you a little bit uh, insight into what has uh, what we have been doing at EEA, and uh, now uh, you know uh, we will have like five more presentations to talk from a perspective of various EEA members, like you know how they have been using trusted compute and uh, uh, and things like that, or how they plan to use it, and then finally we will. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, also have a panel uh, and see uh, and hopefully make it more, uh, you know, bi-directional at that point. Um, so at this point, uh, I will, uh, I think Nicholas, are you around? 
So I'm Nicola Beckham, CTO and co-founder of Fledger. Uh, so I can, I will tell you a bit how we have been using uh, Trusted Compute during the past year. So we have a use case which is a bit original around Trusted Compute because uh, Ledger has been uh, mostly known as a hardware wallet provider so far. But we realized that the main uh, problem, the main issue when people wanted to use a hardware wallet is that, well, they have to buy the hardware wallet. So trusted compute in our trusted compute for us is a way to think about how we can basically change that and if there is a way for people to download the hardware wallet on their existing computers. Uh, so we spent one year thinking about the different security threats that could uh, that we could have on trusted compute and see how we could virtualize as much as possible a hardware wallet. So if we look at what a hardware wallet is doing today, we'll see that we have uh, four different properties. So hardware wallets should be able to protect, first it should be able to protect keys. So when we do an operation on key, uh, an attacker shouldn't be able to access the keys. So that's one of the most important properties. Uh, one difference here is that a hardware wallet should be able to protect against a physical attacker, while uh, we cannot really guarantee that with trusted compute. So that's something we are okay with. I mean, if an attacker has physical access to the device, we are okay with that. Uh, now, after that, so another property is that a hardware wallet should be flexible. So if we have a wallet embedded in a trusted compute environment, we should be, uh, we should be able to update the wallet in all kinds of situations. So even if the device is compromised or even if we have a new DAP, uh, we should be able to load that DAP in the environment and we should be able to, well, we should be able to update uh, the wallet to work with a new use case that we have. So that's very important for Ethereum because we have a lot of dApps. Uh, they all have a different interaction with the user and we want to make sure that the malware will not be able to make you do something else with your dApp. So basically sign something that you didn't want to do and, well, use your funds to do something else. Uh, then we want to make sure that on the hardware wallet we get a user confirmation. So that was something that was missing from our stack before and I will tell after that a little bit more how another Intel API helped us uh, to solve that. Uh, but today if you want to, con user confirmation is paramount uh, when you are spending money because you must click and you must make sure that the user uh, cannot be faked by a malware, so that this click cannot be faked by a malware. And, well, I had another point, so I'm trying to remember it because not the right version of the slides, but if I think about it, I will <laughs> tell it later. Um, so on the things that we have done, we managed to guarantee this portability between hardware wallets and trusted compute by using an architecture which makes an abstraction of uh, the stack. So today when you write an application for a Ledger product, you write your application in C. Uh, we consider that C uh, is portable enough for people to work in several environments. So either you are working in a native environment like a secure element, and in this case you are cross-compiling to ARM. If you are working with an enclave like this one, we cross-compile to uh, a virtual CPU called Moxie, uh, which has been well studied in the Bitcoin environment already. And the virtual machine is very simple, and so you can guarantee that the virtual machine can be, can be tested and can be certified even if you, have the, if you feel the need a bit later. So now moving back um, to where we were in 2017. So we did an initial release, uh, which was not very successful because one of the problems of this release is that all code that you developed for your hardware wallet, so for your new application running on Trusted Compute and SGX, uh, had to be signed by Ledger. And we want to have something completely decentralized, so we want to have something executing securely that you can sign yourself, on which you can trust your certificate, and that's not something we were able to do because we had no way to gather user input and to make sure that user input was executed correctly. Uh, then we heard about a new API from Intel called Protected Transaction Display um, that we used um, typically for several things. So the first thing is that with Protected Transaction Display, uh, you can get user, you can display things to the users that are hard to fake, and you can gather user inputs in a trusted way. So today, the user inputs you can gather are pretty simple. So you have a pin pad, and the pin pad is swapped on screen, so you can't really know uh, what the user has selected if you're a malware. But if you're an enclave, you are going to get the right pin that the user typed. So it's a clean and it's an easy solution to gather secure user input. And we are using it for two things. So we are using it first to get a user confirmation if the code is not signed by Ledger. 
So that's, we are solving the first problem. We can run unsigned code. We can run code that we didn't trust, that we don't trust. And we can limit the features that this code is going to run if it's not signed by us. So here, uh, we talked about the attestation before. We can have an attestation saying, OK, the code is running, uh, the code is trusted by Ledger, running in a trusted platform if the code is signed by us. If it's not signed by us, it can still use all properties of the secure environment without the attestation. So that's an example. Uh, but that's something that's very customizable. And the end result is that people will be able to design their own code without uh, getting a signature from Ledger before. And the other obvious use case of trusted compute, of, sorry, of PTDs, of protected transaction display, is that we can use it to display so, the transaction. So when you're interacting with a smart contract, we can display the transactions that you are sending. And then we can use uh, this as well to load new um, UIs if you are using a new DAP. So today, uh, when you are interacting with a DAP on MetaMask and on another wallet, you are getting, um, if you send some data, you are get, going to see that you are signing a blob. So you don't know what this blob is doing, and you need some kind of other, another UI uh, to confirm and to make sure that you are doing the right thing. And PTD will allow you to solve that along with a platform like ours uh, that lets you run, that lets you load dynamically your new code for your dApps. So you could have one small piece of code, one small piece of script for all the, your new dApps. And this way, we solve all kind of, well, uh, usability problems and security problems at the same time. So that was a short presentation of where we are today. Uh, I wanted to publish some code, but we want to make sure that security-wise we feel comfortable with letting people put uh, real money on it and test it. So what we will do is that in the coming months, we will first do a CTF. So we will publish some code with some material on it, and we will let people try to get the Ether. Uh, so the good thing is that they shouldn't be able to do it. So if people manage to do it, then we will iterate. Uh, we will publish a very detailed test report of everything we did with the wallet. And when we are comfortable with that, so that should be during Q1 of next year, we will release our SDK uh, that will let people download uh, hardware wallets, technically, and play with their own applications. So that's it for me. Hi, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> you're using this PTD API. Um, how does the user know that whatever is displayed on the screen, this shuffled p uh, pin path, as I understand, how does the user know it really is displayed by the trusted enclave? So, uh, so how does the user know that uh, that the screen is really, I mean, that what is displayed is really displayed by the enclave? You don't really have a way to know that because this can still be fooled by fooled by malware. So the idea is that you will ask the user to confirm back something that is displayed on screen. So, for example, if you display an amount, you will ask the user to type the amount again using the wrap pin pad, so using the scramble pin pad. And you will collect that back on the enclave. So if the user is able to type that, it means that, well, what is displayed is correct, basically. So you will ask the user to confirm back by entering again what was displayed on screen. But the, uh, just to clarify, do you also use additional LCD screen on your ledger? No, you don't. You just use, you just, everything is in software, correct? In this picture. So, uh, Host can intercept your keyboard as well as your display. Yes. So I don't see how you can use either way to verify the correctness of the other one. So uh, the host can the host can inter in, in that case the host can intercept the display. So the host cannot. The idea is that the host can display something on top of on what is displayed, but with PTD the host cannot see what is displayed. Oh, so you can. So you can. What prevents the host from simulating everything? Uh, you can so you can simulate everything, but uh, since the host can't know what is displayed, let's say you display an amount, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, the host can display another amount. So the host can say, "Okay, you wanted to pay one dollar. I'm going one ether. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going to tell you are going to pay one thousand ether." So the host can do that, but in this case, you can ask the user to type back using the using the scramble pin pad, so that the host cannot read it either. Because in the, the host cannot read what's in the display. So if you have a scramble pin pad and you ask the user to type back, basically, that the amount was 1 and not 1,000, uh, if the user type 1 and confirm, I mean, you know that, well, you are paying 1. OK, another question. Do you use remote attestation at all for your solution? 
Oh, we are using remote attestation to guarantee that the enclave is genuine, yes. Okay, so um, what do you think about Intel uh, forcing you to use the centralized service for remote attestation? So for the time being, we rely we rely on it. Uh, then we rely on our own attestation, which can be verified on chain. Uh, I think that Intel is working on more flexible attestation schemes uh, that will not be that centralized in the future. Would you, would you say that it's critical for you to have IIS uh, decentralized? IIS service decentralized? I would, like, I would like to see it decentralized. But for the time being, relying on IIS for the bootstrap and then relying on our own attestation scheme for our scripts that we execute in the enclave is good enough. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. I think uh, we're, we're done with the time here. Thank you. So, so the next uh, up is uh, Sid from Weave. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Siddharth Vaseen. Uh, you can call me Sid as well. Um, the lead venture architect with Weave. It's a, it's a deep tech company out of uh, Berlin. And uh, we are um, revolving around the technologies of um, data attestation, data validation, and uh, data communication um, using the powerful paradigms of IoT and blockchain. Unfortunately, um, my CTO, uh, Professor Sebastian Gaik, he was supposed to give the talk today. He couldn't come in, so I'm replacing him today. And um, the the premise of my talk today lies in the foundation of the future. I think we all believe in. Um, so it's 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 revolving around um, the building of a decentralized machine-to-machine -machine economy, uh, autonomous machine-to-machine -machine economy, and how can we use um, trusted IoT oracles for that? Um, so for starters, since we are here, uh, so for the Ethereum network. Um, I'll dive right into it. <laughs> okay, um, so um, we at we we believe that um, IoT devices um, can be good data oracles um, for the Ethereum network, um, but there are there are two fundamental problems in that. There's there's lots of um, compromises right now in how IoT devices are. Um, so there's lots of um, attacks possible, man in the middle attacks, buffer attacks. Um, which which really do not make it possible at this moment to make them good oracles for the for the blockchain or for cloud applications. And once the data has been produced, um, the second layer that the integrity of the data itself, um, data itself is um, not so secure. It can be easily manipulated. It can be faked, um, which again proves a problem um, to make IoT devices good data oracles. Um, so imagine a hybrid car. Charging uh, and charging using an induction loop at a red light crossing, and the wallet needs to pay um, the amount of kilowatt hours of energy uh, which flew in the car and the equivalent amount of money. But then the the car wallet doesn't really know how much, or doesn't really know, uh, or doesn't really have the guarantee that this was the amount of kilowatt of an hour of energy which flew into the car, and um, there needs to be a good attestation um, such that the wallet recognizes this and pays equivalent to that. So. The problem really is how do we ensure um, the truthfulness of this uh, of this value chain and um, the value chain which we do believe is in that we've we've elevated data um, from a resource to to a digital asset and uh, we believe that um, it could be any asset in the physical world. We first when we pay for the asset we kind of have the guarantee that this asset which we are paying for has either been verified or the quality has been assured by some agency. Um, but that's that's not the case with the current infrastructure setup of how data is being um, produced and traded. Um, and even if in the future we do have sort of regulations and infrastructures in place which makes, 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 makes it uh, easy to pay for the data which you're consuming, um, there's still very um, diff there, there, there would still be too many difficulties in post-transaction um, data settlement because just the sheer volume or the velocity of the data which would be flowing, it's very difficult to regulate it after that. Um, so, so the whole um, problem comes when we have to attest the data from source, and this is this is what um, Sanjay and his team at Intel are also doing. So, like having. Um, good data oracles, but then to have good data oracles, we need trusted data flowing in these oracles. And to have trusted data, we first need trusted computing, um, and which is why we kind of follow the analogy of data as a as a asset which has been 
harvested from source, harvested in a manner such that it can be trusted, then processed, then transported, then assessed, and then commercialized. Um, um, so this is, in brief, um, the technology stack we at Viva are building. So we, we build on top of the um, on top of ARM's hardware extension, the Trust Zone, a lightweight, um, trusted execution environment enabled operating system, um, which enables the data to be attested at source. And then um, the, the OS, of course, has certain properties, uh, which allows the sheer um, compartmentalization of, of the, the secure world and the normal world. So you can have all your um, cryptographic keys, your cryptographic materials in the secure world, and your everyday running operations um, in the normal world. So even if your your wallet um, or, or your normal world is hacked, your secure world remains secure, and um, your keys are protected, basically. Um, then, then we have the secure communication protocol. So traditionally, IoT devices have used the MQTT protocol, which, which, around, which, which has around seven communication rounds. Um, and you put TLS SL on top of it, um, then it, it just doesn't become um, usable enough for this, this sheer volume of data flowing for IoT devices or IoT data. Um, so we've tried integrating some sort of a um, simple, um, secure messaging protocol on top of MQTT such so that it's, it's a bit more low latency, it just requires three communication rounds. Um, then the next step is to have, have a testimony. Um, the testimony kind of proves that the program was executed in the manner that was supposed to be executed in. Um, and then finally, you can transport the data to the blockchain layer or the cloud layer, and then where it can be finally realized that this, this data is now truthful and it can be traded or commercialized um, or utilized in some um, intelligent manner. Um, so these are just some brief um, features we think are important. That's why we use the um, ARM Trust Zone um, extension at the moment. Um, in the future, we plan to be compatible with, with Intel SGX, although it's, 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 it's a bit more compatible for cloud architectures at the moment, not so much for embedded systems, um, which is why we use um, ARM's um, Trust Zone ex, um, extension at the moment. So it allows us to isolate programs, um, shield the cryptographic uh, material, and also it has a secure boot process, um, plus um, something we like to call the snags, uh, which basically proves that the program was executed in a certain way. Um, so that's the brief architecture um, of the normal operating system. The secure operating system, um, there's also a 60-page white paper I can, I can have it distributed so you can find all the readings as to what each element does. Um, after the talk. Um, so yeah, finally, um, the Vivo S, um, it has some built-in functionalities. Um, so a crypto API, secure key storage, secure boot, communication protocol, MQTTS, which is the lightweight protocol I mentioned. Um, then the Ethereum wallet, it's an extension to basically allow um, these wallets to pay once the data has been attested automatically, um, and then of course the, the testimony. Um, so the testimony in, in simple terms is basically snapshotting micro instructions um, at regular intervals and, um, and telling, telling the user that the, the data which came in and which is going out, if it's being snapshotted at regular intervals, it can be then verified later on when it has to be verified basically. Um, so we have the GitHub code there. Um, and of course, we are there on Gitter as well. Um, if you want to have a chat with, with our team of developers as well from Berlin. Um, yeah, I guess that's all. Thank you so much, guys. Could you please uh, explain um, a little bit uh, more in deep? like how the attestation system works. Like, who are we exactly trusting here? Uh, because it's quite, it's quite obvious that um, we are trusting whoever is manufacturing the chip yeah. and the ARM trust on architecture. Um, but where does the attestation come from? Because this is not something that trust zone defines. Um, yeah, so the trust zone doesn't do that. That's why we build this, this operating system on top, which has the, the testimony. And the testimony takes um, continuous snapshots of the data uh, which enters the sensors or the processors. And this is where um, the, the attestation comes in. 
So, so next up, so so uh, the, these two presentations were more like you know, uh, getting the external data either into the chain through a transaction or through uh, the oracles. Uh, the next one is around like you know, maybe privacy and uh, it's Guy here, Guy from Enigma. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Guy Ziskind, uh, co-founder and CEO of Enigma. And uh, I want to tell you about privacy preserving smart contracts. Specifically today, there's a much longer conversation tomorrow when I'm going to go much more deeply into the architecture. But today I want to talk to you about some applications, especially those that relate to identity. And I'm going to give just a basic overview of the platform. But again, tomorrow is a talk where, where we really deep dive into this. <clears throat> so. This should be obvious to everyone in this room. Uh, blockchains are public ledgers. That means that all data that you put in a smart contract, anything that you want to process on the blockchain is completely public for everyone to see. That means that if you have an application that needs to process, let's say, your credit card information, that's going to be made available to everyone in the world. And that's obviously unacceptable, which greatly limits the type of applications that you can actually do on the blockchain. And I would even go further and say that there are only, I'd say, maybe a couple of good applications that I can think of that make sense on the blockchain without solving for privacy. So that's really where Enigma comes in. Uh, our goal is really to allow nodes in a distributed network to operate over encrypted data. Uh, that gives us the privacy. We essentially want to upgrade smart contracts into secret contracts. Secret contracts are just plain smart contracts, but they also protect data uh, in transit and in use. Uh, if you want to be a bit more uh, uh, technical about this, uh, smart contracts provide correctness. That's really what excites us in blockchains. The fact that uh, if you put a code on the blockchain and you send some data into it, you're going to get the correct result. And you know, no one can tamper with it, assuming you trust the, the, the you know, the model. So that's great, and that's what, why we're excited about blockchains, but this doesn't protect privacy, and that's where secret contracts come in. So we have Enigma Discovery. Discovery is meant to be the first network uh, that we're releasing. We have a version out right now. It's public. The code is open. We have several companies that are very well known in the space building on us uh, using our technologies. And we're actually making some more improvements, and we will release, I'd say, Discovery um, 2.0 in the next couple of months with a lot more features. And Discovery really means that um, all nodes in the network have to run Intel SGX. Uh, Intel SGX provides us the infrastructure where we can run code uh, securely, both for correctness and privacy. And I do, I'm not going to get into that here, but we, we don't just rely on Intel SGX. Uh, we rely on other things, um, like Ethereum for consensus. But the main idea for that for privacy right now, we get uh, that from SGX. Other properties that are interesting, and this is the first network of its kind, is that uh, discovery is completely permissionless. Uh, anyone can join, can become a node, uh, and get rewards. Uh, it's completely economically incentivized. It uses some kind of POS model. And I think what's mostly interesting for developers in this conference is that it's 100% compatible with Ethereum. That means that you know, if you want to enjoy the security of Ethereum, if you want to continue to develop your decentralized applications on Ethereum, that's fine. By all means, we're not trying, we're not trying to compete or to change your habits. But if there are portions of your applications that need to process sensitive data, well, we provide you the means to actually go from Ethereum to securely compute on Enigma and then back to Ethereum. And we make that very easy for developers and very seamless for the users. <clears throat> so the architecture at a very high level is very similar to how uh, blockchains work today. You have, uh, not shown here, you have, uh, smart, you have developers who basically write uh, secret contracts and deploy that to the Enigma network. And then you have users uh, that uh, communicate with those secret contracts from the outside 
uh, by sending tasks. Tasks are basically special transactions that include encrypted uh, inputs as payload. And that's really, and in, and in the middle, that's really where all the magic happens um, in our network. So I think this is a statement everyone would agree. Modern applications require the use of sensitive data. That's not something that we can debate or change or even want to change. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about one specific example in the identity space that we've been working on together with a company called Data Wallet. So it's pretty common today on the internet that you know, before you subscribe to an application, before you can use some kind of application, you have a gateway. That gateway needs to make sure that you know, you're not trying to game the system and that you're not trying to mount some Sybil attack. It needs to verify that you're a person and that you're a one unique person that you're not creating, let's say, a thousand fake accounts. Uh, that's prevalent in uh, centralized systems, but also decentralized ones. So we're working on data wallet to produce that, and we're working on, on to produce that in a privacy-preserving way um, that is provably correct. So let's see how this works today. And, and, and this kind of construct exists. Today, if you want to use some kind of gateway like that, well, that gateway may ask you to provide some, some of your personal information, like your Facebook data, right? You're going to send that in the clear to, the, to the, that service provider. That service provider is going to run some algorithm. We call it you know, bot or not which simply runs some statistical algorithm that checks whether you are a real person or not. But you have to completely trust that service in both ways. First of all, they can censor you, right? If they don't like you, if they don't like what they see, they can say, you know what, we're, we're, not, we're not giving you the stamp of approval and you cannot continue to use whatever other service you want to use. And what's even worse and more likely is that you give them your social information uh, in the clear. That data, then they get it, they usually store it, and you have no control over what's going on with this. So we want to do better. And what we suggest, and the way uh, this application works here, is essentially just put everything on Enigma in, a, in an encrypted form where you know that creates a neutral safe ground. Uh, the way that this works is that the gateway, the, the developer, they deploy their algorithm as a secret contract to the Enigma network. And on the other hand, the user submits uh, their encrypted data into the network. And then all of these computations happen in the network over encrypted data. The only place where the data is ever decrypted is obviously inside of uh, SGX enclaves where even the host cannot really probe in and see the data. So in a bit more detail about how this was actually built, uh, we have Data Wallet, who developed the front end. That's basically some kind of mobile app that you have on your phone. It allows you to uh, take out uh, your social information from Facebook, uh, and you get that locally. Then using our uh, library, they can, with a click of a button, actually encrypt that data with the key that only exists in enclaves in our network. And then that encrypted data is being sent uh, to the network to an enclave, or actually to several enclaves. And only then, only then, the information is being decrypted inside the enclave, and the enclave itself runs the secret contract. In this case, it's the bot or not algorithm, and then it returns the result. So the only thing that really leaves the network and leaks is the result, which is just like one bit, whether you're a bot or not, whether it's a fake account or not. Now, this is just really touching the, the surface. Uh, there's a lot of companies in the space building a, 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 a host of applications that are needed for the space. We're talking decentralized governance. We're talking auctions. We're talking uh, protecting states in games. Um, this was an example about uh, identity and cyber prevention. Um, we have work done on decentralized credit and other machine learning applications. It's, it's really the sky, the sky are the limit if you can really protect privacy. 
And tomorrow I'm gonna go much more deeply into the architecture and these use cases, and I'm gonna mention some real names and show real code and examples of partners we're working with. Uh, so I, I do suggest uh, if you're interested in this, you attend tomorrow, it's gonna be uh, here at 12.30, uh, so you're all welcome. Thank you. Thank you. The obligatory question, how does the application know it actually uploads the data to an, uh, and to the enclave that the application wants to trust? Right, so basically what happens is that we have a registration process for every worker in our network. That worker basically creates a new key inside the enclave that they sign. They, that go through the IAS and, and provide the proof that this was created. So you, you rely on IAS and remote attestation. How does it not concern you that this introduces centralization to your... Sorry? How does it not concern you that this creates a centralized point for you? Well, I mean, what we do is we do it only in a bootstrapping phase. So there's a registration, you go to IAS once, you, you know, you get, uh, they sign the report, that goes on the chain. And this is right now the best we can do. We would love to see a decentralized IAS, but beyond that process, if you trust that trusted setup, then you're good. Okay, uh, thanks, Guy. Thank you. So uh, uh, next up to give his perspective on this one is Noah from OSS Labs. Hey, everyone. Uh, so my name is Noah Johnson. I'm with OSS Labs, and I'm going to talk about what we're building at OSS. So. Um, you know, of course, blockchain is an exciting technology that provides uh, a number of unique uh, properties and capabilities like, you know, openness, decentralization, uh, integrity guarantees. Um, but as uh, has been well motivated today, uh, blockchain by itself doesn't provide privacy, right? And this is very uh, limiting. This severely restricts the sorts of applications that you can run on today's blockchain platforms. And so what we're building at Oasis is a platform that protects data um, protects data and smart contract state uh, and provides privacy at every layer of the stack. So at the application layer, we have a set of tools and libraries that allow developers to safely analyze and, and compute on sensitive data uh, with guarantees that the results of those computations actually don't violate privacy. Um, at the platform layer, we have a system for ensuring that workers can't view the data or steal the data. And then we have a scalability architecture that allows the entire system to support uh, much more complex sorts of applications that you could run today. So this is really a top to bottom approach, all of which I, I think is necessary to provide end to end privacy. It's not sufficient to just protect the data on the workers um, if it's trivial to write a smart contract that actually uh, leaks out sensitive data. Um, so this is our approach. Our use of trusted compute um, and secure hardware is at this layer. So this is specifically concerned with the problem of, you know, given an open network and workers whom you may not trust, uh, if those workers are computing on sensitive data, how do you make sure that they can't actually leak the data? And so what we're aiming for is essentially a model called uh, confidentiality preserving smart contract execution. And, and the general idea is that all of the inputs and outputs of a smart contract are encrypted um, so that nobody in the network um, is actually able to view the contents. Um, except the smart contract itself. So this means no nodes can view the data, the gateway can't view the data, and even the worker that is processing uh, the smart contract can't view the data. So how do you actually access this functionality? So today, if you want to call into a smart contract, you would usually use um, existing interfaces like Web3. Um, unfortunately, Web3 was designed under the assumption that all data is public, so the existing APIs actually are, are insufficient. And so for that reason, we've developed an extension to Web3 called Confidential Web3 that adds new APIs that essentially allow users to construct a secure channel into the smart contract so that they can encrypt the transaction payload in such a way that only the smart contract can actually decrypt it. Um, and so Web3 is backwards compatible with standard, uh, sorry, confidential Web3 is backwards compatible with standard Web3. And so it's a, you know, it's a drop-in replacement. The modifications that are needed um, to existing applications are very minor. Um, we might also look at supporting uh, EEA's trusted compute API as well, given that you know, it solves a largely similar problem. So there are a number of different technologies for enabling uh, secure computing. 
Um, these are generally classified into you know, techniques that rely on secure hardware and crypto-based techniques that don't rely on secure hardware. They re instead rely on cryptographic algorithms. Um, so there are different trade-offs to all these techniques. As, as Sanjay was, was mentioning earlier, there's no single approach that is a silver bullet and is the, you know, the optimal approach. Uh, it depends on the application and it depends on um, the performance requirements and, and the threat model. And so the goal of Oasis is to integrate all these different technologies into a single platform and allow the developer to decide which one they want to use and make it very easy for them to have access to these technologies. Um, one of the reasons we're especially excited about secure hardware is that of these techniques, it's by far the most performant uh, and the most general purpose. So the fact that you can run code you know, directly on bare metal means that um, you can run essentially any application and you pay very little in terms of performance overhead. So this is the first uh, technology that we'll expose uh, in Oasis. If people aren't familiar with secure hardware, the, the basic properties that provided by secure hardware are um, essentially the hardware allows code to construct what's called a trusted execution environment in which you can put applications and data. And you have a guarantee that uh, nobody else on the machine, the applications, the operating system, even the user, is actually able to view or, or tamper with uh, the contents of this trusted execution environment. So this provides both integrity and confidentiality, and also allows the hardware to generate a certificate um, that can be verified by a remote party to prove that the hardware is is genuine and you know the right code is running. So this goal of sort of emulating an ideal trusted third party, right, to provide certain guarantees even in the face of you know, untrusted parts of the system are very similar to the goals of you know, a general smart contract platform. Right? And it turns out that smart contracts and T's have very similar and, and in fact complementary properties. For example, smart contract platforms provide strong availability given it's a decentralized network. If one node goes down, you can still access the network. State is stored on a permanent ledger, so there's persistence. But as we mentioned earlier, uh, today's smart contract platforms don't provide any confidentiality for data or state. On the other hand, trusted execution environments provide weak availability, given that you know, anyone can just shut off a machine that is running a trusted execution environment, and you would lose the application state. Because T's don't have direct access to uh, durable storage, they don't provide persistence, but they do provide confidentiality. And so the fact that we have these complementary properties means if you combine the technologies together, you can get the best of both worlds. And that's exactly what we did in our previous research project called Akedon. So we showed how to run smart contracts inside a trusted execution environment in order to uh, endow the smart contracts with confidentiality and attach that to consensus and a distributed ledger in order to retain all the benefits of, of blockchain and decentralization. So all the details are in this paper. We're also working uh, with a project called Keystone, which is a fully open source design for secure hardware. So today, the sort of the state of the art uh, uh, secure enclave technology is is Intel SGX, and it's it's nice in that you know it runs on commodity hardware, uh, has very very high performance. We want to provide more options to developers. Uh, we want to grow the ecosystem. Um, and one of the things we want to use Keystone for is to kind of uh, explore new designs and secure enclaves um, and bring together researchers in an open platform for figuring out, you know, what are the limitations of today's designs and how do we improve on them. So Keystone eventually will publish a specification for a secure enclave um, that is royalty free, that can be manufactured by any chip maker. Um, and as those chips become available, they'll be exposed through the Oasis platform so developers can choose whether they want to use, for example, SGX or Keystone. So the idea is to grow the entire community by you know, accelerating adoption of, of secure enclave technologies and allowing developers to choose which one makes sense for their application. A few weeks ago, we hosted a workshop at Berkeley specifically around uh, how to design open source enclaves. And we brought together uh, industry and academic leaders in this space to talk about you know, what are the open problems and how do we work together towards this goal. OK, so once you can protect data on a smart contract platform, this opens the door for a lot of really exciting applications. Here's a list of some of them. Um, many of these are already being developed um, on the Oasis platform, things like credit scoring and decentralized exchanges. I want to talk about one application that's especially exciting. This is called Kara, and Kara is uh, being deployed on Oasis. 
It's designed to solve this problem of data silos around medical data. So today, you know, uh, medical data is extremely valuable for, for research purposes, uh, but users are reluctant to share their medical data, rightly so, primarily because of privacy concerns, right? Because they don't know what people will use the data for. So CARA tries to solve that problem, and the way it does that is by allowing patients and doctors to input their data into a smart contract, and researchers that want to train models on that data um, can submit those models to the smart contract, and the smart contract sort of mediates that interaction. Um, and the entire thing runs on the Oasis blockchain. Once the model is trained, the users are paid tokens um, for, you know, to compensate them for contributing their data, and the researcher receives a trained model. So the nice thing about running this as a smart contract, of course, is that it means that patients don't have to trust researchers. They know that their data will only be used for the purpose of training this machine learning model. And because this runs on a platform that can expose secure enclaves, then all of the computation can run in a secure enclave allowing patients to know that their data won't be leaked uh, or viewed by even the worker that's doing this training. And this is exactly why secure enclaves are so exciting for these sorts of applications, is because it allows you to run uh, very complex uh, application workloads with very little performance overhead while getting those security guarantees. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about this or you want to get involved, one of the developers uh, of this project, Nick, is actually in attendance today, uh, and he'd love to chat with you. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. If you're interested in building a privacy-preserving application on our testnet, you can go to this URL. You can sign up to our Twitter to, uh, to, to get updates. And um, you know, if you're interested in this space and, and you want to help us build the system, we're always looking for, for passionate people who are uh, really excited about privacy as we are. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Noah. So now, a uh, uh, little bit we uh, shift the gear in the sense like, you know, uh, in the last two sections, it was uh, the idea was to say, you know, how you could use some of these things uh, with some real world applications that uh, uh, various partners are building. And uh, now I will have uh, Marley from Microsoft uh, talk about, like, you know, uh, if you were to uh, say that, okay, I want to build something on these enclaves, where could I actually? And get access to this hardware and uh, uh, and uh, oh, and what's the environment? So, Marley, yes, sir. get my slides up here in a minute. Um, so, uh, Microsoft. Um, we're from. Um, I work in the Azure team, and that's our cloud platform. And one of the major issues of adoption um, for clouds is why would I run my code in a public network when you know I, it? I have to trust you, Microsoft. Um, to not you know, steal my intellectual property and then you know, do all the evil things that you used to do in the past, Darth Vader-ish. Um, so we see uh, confidential competing sort of holistically and say this is super important for us to grow our core business. We have to be able to have a cloud platform that our uh, customers, whether they're a large corporation or someone building a decentralized application, or what I would like to call the next generation killer decentralized application, needs to have the ability to, just in time, grab a, a secure uh, enclave, we'll talk about this in a minute, to be able to execute some arbitrary code uh, and confidentially execute that, and then you know, have it, uh, uh, its results uh, published on some network of some sort. How do we make that possible? What infrastructure is required? Um, so, uh, so our main goal is primarily to remove Microsoft <laughs> out of the trust base. So you no longer have to trust Microsoft to run your data and your code in, in our cloud, which seems kind of weird, but uh, that's really core to us growing our business. Uh, it's core to not only getting uh, you know, our largest uh, financial services customers, but also uh, a lot of you folks that are really concerned with you know, <laughs> centralization. And, and the, I've been doing this since 2015, and I always get that first question. People walk up to me and go, what's Microsoft doing here? You're centralized, you know. You know it's okay. Uh, we get it, but we're we're trying to contribute into the distributed space. So well, this is broadly applicable. So uh, the thing that we've all the previous speakers 
um, talked about is how do you apply enclaves? The, the, news is, the good news is you can apply it in a lot of different ways, and it solves a lot of different problems, but it is, it's not a hammer, right? It, it, it is your hammer, and everything's a nail. You try to hit it. It doesn't solve every problem, but when you do find sort of an intractable problem, having an enclave uh, available to you lets you explore different ways you can solve those difficult problems, particularly around uh, privacy and confidentiality. So let's uh, skip through this. So we're, we're looking at things like machine learning, SQL Server, uh, essentially anything that we're running in the cloud is, is looking at how they're going to use TEEs or trusted compute to enhance their product to remove Microsoft from the chess chain. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, some basic things we're doing sort of broadly. Um, we want to have, of course, this, we think this is going to apply everywhere. We, we're really interested in hearing uh, customers how they're using it. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that we encourage them to do that. Any of you worked with enclaves? Anybody written an app that runs in an enclave? Come on, show of hands. All right. A handful of you. Relatively speaking, how easy was it? Extremely easy? No, it wasn't. You're, it's probably easy now, but really you probably look back at it, you have some scar tissue because it was very difficult. Um, what we're trying to do is, it's not just getting your code to run in the Enclave, but it's also how do you get your data to the Enclave. How, there's a lot of infrastructure you have to do there. So we want to make it very easy for you to get your, um, your uh, to introduce this into your environments. So we want to solve those difficult problems. Um, some of the things we're doing, we're trying to work with this open Enclave SDK. Um, we too share the uh, desire not to uh, to provide choice in enclaves, we're a huge customer of Intel. They're a huge partner, but um, there's uh, our customers want other options. So we have things like a, a hypervisor-based enclave. Uh, that's an option. Working with other hardware providers to make sure that um, we, we provide a, um, an, a platform that gives you choice in enclaves. But that also introduces an additional problem, which... Then you start to say, okay, now I have to write my code specific to the type of enclave that I'm using, and that creates a significant problem. So we're also investing a lot through Microsoft Research in building what we call the Open Enclave SDK. So this is an open source SDK that we will allow you to, to write your apps through that SDK and abstract yourself from the actual implementation. So you sort of get the, the JVM type experience where you can write your code once and not really be concerned with which actual enclave that you're using. So that's sort of a, a pragmatic approach to doing that. We'll still have scenarios where you're going to want to write to the bare metal, but there's a lot of scenarios where you don't want to do that, or it's not the most cost-effective thing for you to do. So these abstractions are very important. Um, so we talk about SGX and VSM, and, and others will come across. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Sanjay, please. Thank you. Uh, two basic... Uh, Things that we're trying to do, these are examples of frameworks that we're working on to try to, uh, to allow customers to build killer applications. We think that's going to be what really drives blockchain networks. Um, we've worked a lot with tons and tons of customers to try to establish networks and um, to, to roll these consortiums out and uh, for the EEA. It's very difficult to justify rolling out this infrastructure and, and contributing a lot of the, the resources needed to, to work with your fiercest competitors, <laughs> to invest that time and money to, to build a network that will smooth operations across that ecosystem. It sounds very noble, but at the end of the day, people that are writing those checks don't really, you know, the friction in the marketplace, as long as they're spread in it, they're good. Um, so what's gonna actually be the tipping point are killer applications that are consumer facing, enterprise-facing, industry-facing, crossing industries. So what we need to do is be able to address some fundamental problems in architecture and infrastructure to uh, start uh, having tools and platforms available so you can start to build those killer applications. One of them uh, released was called, um, is called the Confidential Compute Blockchain Framework. This is essentially a node level uh, data tier optimization. Um, it is not a blockchain, um, it is essentially an open source project we'll be releasing soon. Can't give you the exact date, but uh, Mark's shaking his head at the back. Um, that uh, will be released soon. That essentially provides a framework to use, um, in this case, SGX 
uh, to create a confidential compute consortium, right? It's not for public. This is a private consortium network that will give you a governance framework, so it controls who you let into your network. Privacy, so you can have essential privacy. And then performance, because we introduce trusted compute, we can use uh, faster consensus algorithms. So it's a, a framework that's uh, available, and then you could take uh, that framework and build on top of it to create uh, high performance uh, comp uh, consortium blockchains uh, on uh, this platform to really deliver on some of the enterprise promises that we at the EAA are striving to make possible. Um, above that is another thing in the middle tier, so sort of how do I build applications uh, and wrap and give me that infrastructure to where I can execute code and logic off chain um, and then persist that on chain. So I usually tell people the, the um, I have to explain this a lot. <laughs> And I talk about the blockchain being the distributed truth. So uh, most of you will get this because it's the audience and the demographic I have in the room. So if I go and look at the blockchain and I look and I see the answer to my question is 42. And the question is, what's the meaning of life and everything? I didn't know that. Um, so if you haven't read Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I encourage you to do so. But this is one of the big themes that runs throughout. As you go and you seek this answer, you're looking to get, find the answer to what is the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, and you finally learn the answer is 42. How many of you are going to be satisfied with that answer? And the answer is no one is going to be satisfied with the answer. Even though you know it's the truth, it's on the blockchain. So what do we have to do to be able to you know, accept that as the answer? Well, you're going to go off on a wild track across the galaxy to you know, compute all these things, you'll come back and sure enough, the answer is 42. The next person comes up and they go, well, what's the answer? They see 42. They're not gonna believe it. They're gonna go do the same thing again. That's what blockchain networks do, right? We just compute the same thing over and over again to satisfy that yes, the answer is 42. The next person comes in, they don't trust it, so they gotta recompute it. Now that works great, but it's not gonna solve all of our problems. We need to be able to pull things off or particularly the contract, if you think of what a, a contract is, it's a trust agreement between discrete parties. The only people that really care about the answer being 42, and, and really the question, are the counterparties to that contract. So if I can pull that off and write that, then write the answer 42 down, then you, as someone that's on this blockchain, you didn't necessarily ask the question, you see the answer is 42, and you're like, oh, big deal, I'm good with that. Move on. So, uh, middle tier, uh, we think uh, solving those types of problems, we call it the, um, the truth resolution tier. So, uh, to have an option to pull uh, your contract logic and all sorts of oracles and, and things like that off. So, trusted compute and blockchain involves that as well, and, and we address that in the TE, the trusted compute specification. Um, so, our middle tier, we're trying to make it easy for you to um, use enclaves in the middle tier, so it's more of a pooling, getting scarce resources just in time to do certain things uh, that you want done in private. Let's go to the next one. So yesterday I published a blog um, uh, announcing the release of the Enclave Ready uh, EVM, which is a uh, open source C++ implementation of the EVM. Um, it is, uh, it has no dependencies outside of, so you don't need to even use the Intel SD X SDK, um, it'll run as is. It run outside of an enclave as well. Um, some things about it, it's not fully functional. It doesn't count gas, right? Um, it is compatible with the EVM opcodes for Homestead. Uh, let's see, it will do existing bytecode, things like this. Um, but there's some interesting things about this, and we built this not because we're trying to compete with Ethereum <laughs> or come out with a a Ethereum virtual machine that's better than anyone else. We had to build this for the confidential compute blockchain framework. We had to be able to test this infrastructure, so we had to have smart contracts that would execute in a TE to see is this actually going to work. So what we did is we said, okay, well, let's just release that work out because we think it's going to be valuable. And let me give you some for examples. Um, this type of code, you can take it and modify it, and uh, you can add in these features because it is decoupled from the consensus algorithm. You could use something like the ABCI interface, uh, like Burrow, Burrow uses, to have an enclave, um, this enclave EVM run off-chain. 
um, and then write results onto the chain. Um, sometimes we call that, even on the public network record, so it must be um, checksum uh, node that actually executes the code in SGX. The rest of them don't have to do that. Um, as long as you come to agreement on consensus, it would be an interesting scenario. Um, it is a MIT license, so uh, currently. Uh, it won't go any more restrictive, I don't believe. So. All right, next slide. Oh, there, there, the URL's there. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> uh, on GitHub, so let's go next. Here's another example. This is sort of a, an eye chart. This is uh, more of an example of how what we do in the middle tier. One of the things that we do, and um, a lot of customers have difficulty in the enterprise of managing keys. They want to have key management. Building blockchain applications for enterprise organizations creates a huge problem in that you're... Uh, if you need to sign your transactions for each individual person, you've got a lot of keys to manage. Um, what we do uh, here is uh, we use HSMs. Uh, in Azure, that is a service we call Azure Key Vault. Uh, we front end that with some enclaves, and we can, uh, at runtime, when you're running an execution of some logic, it could be any type of code. We call that code running in um, that your logic called a cripplet. You create some sort of a result like 42, and you need to sign your uh, proof. Um, and actually, we're not talking about an enclave proof. We're just saying, I need to sign this transaction. Um, uh, but I don't want to, to have my keys inside this code. I think uh, we use this as what we call a crypto delegate. We just delegate all cryptographic operations to an enclave um, out of the pool. And in the future, we think this will be useful to create some of these multi-party compute scenarios where we can do uh, rapidly create things like ring and threshold uh, artifacts out of this. Okay, next slide. Try to stay on time here. So big picture, um, again, we're, we're building sort of a, a broad platform, um, blockchain agnostic. We started with Ethereum, uh, but we support essentially all blockchains. Um, go ahead and hit the next one. Let's just blow this out. So we're to give you an example. Um, CCBF is that, that lower level, so this is the tiering, so the data tier, introducing a framework that allows you to build the next generation consortium, so this is private, right, uh, network. Um, so that's, that's down here. Uh, middleware platforms, uh, there's a range of services that we'll be introducing. Uh, this is language agnostic, but you know, the intention is to be able to support any language, any runtime, whether it's WASM, uh, .NET Core, Java, JVM, uh, actually working on uh, those in the room, uh, actually working on that, that implementation right now. And then we also have an offering called Azure Workbench, a blockchain workbench, which allows you to rapidly prototype um, your solution. So any of you that are trying to build an application uh, or to, to get funding for one or get approval to do it, uh, but you don't have anything to show for it, you can rapidly build an application here uh, and Workbench and have it build a solution on uh, Ethereum or uh, EEA um, implementation and go get your funding because that's a pretty user interface and it has all the features and bells and whistles that you want to, to demonstrate. So it's an awesome tool to, to go out and rapidly uh, move forward towards your use cases. All right, that's it for me. So I think the last up uh, for the presentation is Lay from IXEC, and uh, so so in this one it's a short presentation, and I think a short demo uh, to uh, you know uh, put uh, put some of these things in context. Um, yeah, great. Thank you. Actually, I turned my head. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lay, and I am from IXEC Blockchain technology, which is based in Lyon, in France. So uh, today, I would like to give you a presentation on our iExec end-to-end trusted execution with Intel SGX, which is the first uh, scalable solution for business purpose to secure the blockchain-based computing using Intel SGX. I would like to start uh, with talking about what is it's Intel SGX, although I know a lot of you guys understand how it works. So Intel SGX stands for Intel Software Guard Extensions. So uh, basically it's Intel Security Technology, which is available since 2016. 
And Intel SGX is based on the uh, secret keys that are fused inside the CPU during the manufacture. So basically, it's a hardware-based uh, security uh, technologies, which means it leaves very, very little attack interface for the malicious attackers. So basically, you can consider SGX as a secured bubble surrounding your application and protect your applications from the host machine. For example, uh, if I have a FanTac applications, uh, which contains some of my sensitive data, I want to run these applications on the decentralized networks. Say, if the application runs on your machine, think about it, you are the administrator of your machine, right? You have hundreds of ways to easily access to this application and steal my sensitive data in which is involved in this application. So thanks to this Intel SGX technology, so Intel SGX creates a bubble which strictly isolates the application from the host machine. So in this case, even you are the administrator of your machine, you cannot penetrate this bubble and access to my applications, to tamper my applications, to steal the secrets involved in this application. So based on the SGX technology, we propose our solution which provides end-to-end -end data protection for the applications running on the uh, blockchain-based decentralized networks. So firstly, what is our definition of end-to-end -end, uh, data protection? We know that a typical uh, application data consists of three parts. The application input data, so mostly probably it's from the user side, user input data. The application embedded data and application output data. Normally it refers to the application result, right? So our end-to-end -end for protection means a protection of all these application data. All these application data stays in the encrypted status during the whole procedure of running application. So decryption only happens inside a high secure SGX bubble, which is also called SGX enclave, and cannot be accessible from outside world. So from outside world, everything happens in this uh, un uh, SGX enclave is in the encrypted status. Take example, I have a FanTac application, right? I want to run it on the uh, blockchain-based decentralized networks. And this FanTac application requires some user, user input data. So from my side, this user input data could uh, ask me some about my, say, bank account inform information, my privacy information. So I definitely don't want these, my personal information to be just diffused to a decentralized networks. So all these user input data has to be encrypted before sending to the decentralized networks to feed the application execution. And at the runtime of the application, this application runs in the Intel uh, SGX enclave. So from, again, from outside the world, everything happens in this uh, SGX bubble is encrypted status. And finally, when the application finishes running, it, we have the result. And the result is also encrypted inside this SGX enclave. So finally, only the corresponding user who triggered this application is able to download the, applica uh, download the application output. And only this corresponding user is able to decrypt the application output. So this is extremely important for the uh, decentralized applications which contain some sensitive data. And another great uh, use case, the data monetizing. Say if I am a data provider, I would like to make money by renting my data to you to feed your application. I definitely don't want you just to copy my data and resell it to someone else, right? So uh, the end-to-end -end for data protection is really a essential requirement in such a uh, contest and use case. So we talk about end-to-end -end, uh, for, for data protection. 
and why it is so important to our Isaac platform and blockchain-based cloud com uh, based blockchain based computing. So we know that the core of a blockchain is its decentralization, which means the data the application is running on the decentralized networks, right? So a question, a question is naturally raised. Does decentralized networks mean trustless? To some extent, yes. Think about the legacy centralized networks. Think about the uh, cloud provider, how it works. So there is a centralized entity or the cloud provider, cloud administrator, who is there to deploy the sophisticated security mechanisms just to protect your applications run on their, uh, on their uh, centralized networks, right? But for the blockchain-based decentralized networks, there is no such administrator who is there to protect the applications running on the decentralized networks. So without the end-to-end -end data protection, all your application data are just exposed to the millions of decentralized nodes. So for our Isaac platform, so basically our Isaac platform, we offer a blockchain-based platform to trade computing resources. So basically, if you are a server provider, you can join our platform to monetize your server service. If you are an application provider, you can join our platform to monetize your application service. And it's similar if you are a data set provider. Since our platform is blockchain-based, so all these data applications running on the decentralized networks. So thanks to this end-to-end -end protection, the application and data service can then be monetizable in a secure way via our Isaac decentralized platform. So the full data protection and a trusted execution is a must, is a must for Isaac platform and blockchain-based uh, blockchain based computing. Okay, so uh, I just talked about uh, what is Intel SGX. I also talk about uh, what is end-to-end -end data protection and uh, why the end-to-end uh, -end data protection trust execution is so important to Isaac platform and to blockchain-based computing. So here is our solution. Our solution, which is based on Intel SGX solution uh, uh, technology, which provides end-to-end -end data protection for Isaac platform and a blockchain-based computing. So our solution, firstly, provides a full data protection covering application input data, application embedded data, and application output data. So protecting these application data is running on the decentralized networks. Secondly, our solution allows to make sure the corrected applications are correctly execute, ex executed and the execution are neither tempered nor interrupted by any malicious attackers. So basically, uh, we assure user, in the perspective of user side, we can assure user that two points. The first point, well, this is actually the expected application, the correct application that is actually running. The second point, these applications are correctly running. It's neither tempered nor interrupted by any other malicious attackers. And our solution is based on SCON framework. So uh, we're currently uh, working closely with SCON team to push for to push forward this uh, our uh, SGX solution based on the SCON framework. And our solution is also EA compatible, which leverages EA trusted computing specification. So which was just released several days ago. So, uh, and this EEA trusted computing specification, we believe it's a milestone for the Ethereum community to support the trusted computing. Okay, so here is a workflow of our Isaac end-to-end -end trusted execution uh, with Intel SGX. So principally, principally it contains three uh, steps. The first step focus on the user input data encryption. So remember what I talked about the end to end uh, uh, data protection. So if basically if user want to trick a decentralized applications, so firstly, user input data has to be protected, 
has to be strictly encrypted and protected. So the step one, the user, uh, the user input data is strictly encrypted at the user side with the user generated secret keys. And the, user, uh, the encrypted user input data can then be transferred to the remote file system. And the secret key can also update it to the secret management service, which is also SGX based. And for step two, the user is able to trigger the off chain uh, applications running on the decentralized node. So, uh, uh, this a user can trigger this off-chain computing via our Isaac Marketplace, which is also based on the blockchain transaction. So as soon as the off-chain application starts running at the decentralized node, a SGX bubble is automatically created to protect the running application. So firstly, the application will retrieve the user encrypted data from the remote file system, and then uh, application will also pull the secret keys from the SGX management service via high security channel, so uh, which is called SGX provision channel. And then the, the secret key uh, allows to decrypt the user input data inside this SGX enclave. And the decrypted data is used to feed the application execution. And when the application finishes running, the output is also encrypted inside uh, this uh, SGX enclave. And a uh, execution attestation is also provided inside this SGX enclave. So the step three, finally, the user can just download the uh, application output, uh, which is encrypted inside uh, this SGX uh, enclave. And I want to underline that only the corresponding user is able to download the output, and only the corresponding user is able to decrypt the application output. So uh, I would like to show a demo. Uh, let, let's see. Okay. Okay, that's all. So uh, basically, uh, this is a. Let's start again. Okay, so uh, actually, uh, this demo is based on the. Uh, uh, a 3D uh, rendering blend applications. So this demo uh, can show you, show the user how the, uh, to use our SGX uh, solution to protect, protect user input data and output data and provide full data protections. So uh, firstly, user only needs to run a simple command, the Isaac TE init, which allows to initialize the SGX project. And then the user uh, just copy his user input data to a specific, specific uh, folder, which is the TE imports. And the user runs a very simple command, which is a T, uh, Isaac TE encrypt push. So basically, this command uh, represents the step one of our workflow. So basically, which allows to encrypt users' uh, input data and push it to the uh, a remote file system. So uh, basically, uh, the, the, uh, this command returns output, which contains some parameters like the URL pointing to the remote file system, storing uh, the user's encrypted data. And the user just does some uh, several uh, simple configurations with this URL, uh, because this URL will be uh, used to, uh, to feed to the second step. So basically, uh, the second step is that user want to trigger the off-chain uh, applications running on the decentralized node. So a user can, uh, can based on Isaac uh, Marketplace, the user can choose an available SGX work pool. And when, as soon as the user choose available uh, SGX work pool, he can trigger the off-chain applications via our uh, simple command, so which is Isaac or the field. A uh, user can also use the option watch uh, to monitor in real time the running status of the ex application execution. And the user can al also use the option download to download uh, the application output as soon as the application finishes running. So user can also uh, monitor, uh, monitor the uh, status of the application execution via our UI uh, interface 
via the Isaac Explorer or uh, uh, governor. So, uh, so for example, he has a running status of the ap uh, application. Uh, so the blockchain transaction takes some time. And, uh, so finally, as soon as, as the application finishes running, so uh, the user only needs to run a very simple command, so which is the IVIC TE decrypt. So this command allows to uh, decrypt the ap application output and push the uh, decrypt output to a specific, specific folder, which is names the uh, TE outputs. So here we can see that the uh, this application automatically decrypt decrypted outputs and push to TE outputs. So the user go to TE and outputs and see the this is the output of the uh, of the application result. Well, so uh, I would like to analyze that only the, uh, so the corresponding so layer, layer. We are running very okay. late on time. So I think we'll hold off uh, any questions, then you can catch Lei after the meeting. Uh, and thanks, Lei. Uh, so, so we we wanted to also like you know ho try to hopefully make it a little bit more interactive, and we'll have a short panel with Tom and Lee. <laughs> Our hope is that uh, you know we entertain you, uh, perhaps by our disagreements. Um, and so I have a set of questions I can ask them, but if there's any questions that are really, you know, burning inside, um, you know, you, and you from the audience can also ask them. And um, I think, you know, we should probably start by introducing ourselves. So I'm Tom Willis. I'm at Intel. Um, I'm, uh, what, am, what am I? I'm uh, a board member of the EEA, and I'm also a director in the Open Source Technology Center. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Bertani, I'm the CEO of uh, Oracle Eyes. Uh, we are the most widely used Oracle service on Ethereum right now on the mainnet. And we have approximately 1,000 contracts, smart contracts, using our Oracle API, which uses TE to secure the authenticity of data. Andreas Freund from Consensus. Um, my role there is the blockchain Swiss Army knife. I'm a CSO for Golem, uh, Joanna Rutkowska, um, and uh, our aim is to create user-controlled cloud, essentially. Marley Gray, Microsoft. Yeah, San Sanjay. Okay, so my first question for the panel is, we just uh, released this um, trusted compute specification from the EEA. Um, why is why is how does this help and why is it important? Anybody want to start that answer to that question? Oh. Do you okay. Want to okay. Uh, so, so the thing is like the reason we uh, like one of the things like you know the uh, EA came into the uh, being is uh, to create standardized interfaces, interoperability between clients, implementing all kinds of various types of. Uh, say, uh, uh, scalability solution and things like that. As part of that, uh, we uh, uh, noticed that there are different ways the off-chain compute based on, uh, you know, TEs and other kinds of like zero knowledge and uh, MPC can be also very relevant in this space. So the idea was to create a, uh, a standardized interface behind which all these implementations can uh, sit uh, uh, seamlessly and uh, for a smart contract developer, uh, whether they are talking, they, uh, they should be able to use a common interface to, uh, without having to worry about the implementation of this off-chain uh, trusted compute. Yeah, if I can add something, I think that this effort uh, is really important because right now, um, whoever uh, like us is already uh, like in looking for something like this uh, has basically to design its own solution. Um, which can be hardly uh, compatible uh, with the competitors, of course. So having someone like uh, the Ethereum Enterprise Alliance uh, pushing for like a common uh, standard interface uh, helps to understand better the, the needs of everyone um, in you know a neutral ground. Um, and having a standard like this going forward will possibly also try to find a common ground between the enterprise needs and the uh, you know public chain needs. 
because right now they, they are very different, but we expect in the future that they may converge. Uh, so um, yeah, we are totally um, like um, supporting this and looking forward to keep contributing to the next specifications as well. Okay, next question. Um, we've heard a lot about decentralization here at um, this conference. Does trusted compute help decentralization or hurt decentralization, or does it depend how we implement it? So um, maybe I will focus on SGX especially. Uh, SGX, unfortunately, even though it's exciting technology, it really is, but uh, as it is in a current shape with those two centralized uh, creations, one of those is remote attestation, which, let me stress it one more time, requires centralized Intel-operated Intel attestation service, AIS. Without AIS, without contacting AIS for every execution of Enclave, of a new provision Enclave, SGX is meaningless. Let me stress this. It's meaningless without AIS, and AIS is in full control of Intel. It's a centralized point which nullifies all the decentralized attempts that it tries to help. Another centralized point, which is often, um, which we often miss in this, is the uh, Intel's control on the launching of Enclave, which Intel has recently made some steps with flexible launch control, which is a good step, but it's still, as far as I know, no hardware is available, very few details in the spec. There are some corner cases that are not clear whether it will actually make practical sense or not. So two things, centralized IIS and centralized policing on launch, launch and, uh, enclave, uh, on launching the enclaves. It's, it's very problematic from centralization for me. SGX, you know, it's like AMD, Trust Zone, MPC, CK, CK proofs. Decentralization is not going to be achieved by a single of those technologies. Only in combination will we achieve that, and only once we can reliably push out um, trust compute loads um, to every one of you. Right? That's the that's the the, the promise of, of of decentralized trusted fog computing. Because in the end, if you look where things are going, especially around AI, if we don't have trusted compute at the edge, everything is still going to be run by Google, right? So at that point, who cares, right? So um, having the interfaces, the specs, is, a, is an important step in the right direction because now everybody can, can, can build towards that towards that, that spec and make their, their services um, available. And I really encourage everyone or someone out there who wants to start a marketplace for trusted compute services using laptops, go for it. I'll support you. Um, otherwise, the rest, focusing on one technology versus the other, it, that's, that's, a, that's a sideshow. It's completely unimportant. So uh, I just want to add uh, one thing is like, uh, when I uh, started to engage with the uh, Ethereum community um, close to like, you know, a year and a half, uh, and uh, I quickly figured out uh, the two points of uh, that we have uh, centralization, uh, are we, I would say, had, as uh, Joanna was talking about this, uh, you know, the IAS thing, and as well as uh, uh, the flexible, uh, as well as the uh, Enclave launch control. Um, so, what uh, what I can share is that uh, uh, we at Intel looked at that and uh, uh, and we have worked out the solutions for those things because uh, uh, keeping Intel in the middle of those kinds of things, uh, you know, generally uh, we we believe is uh, we want to go away from that. Uh, so what I would say is uh, like stay tuned. Uh, in a very uh, short period of time, we will be. Uh, you will see, like you know, how Intel is basically making it, uh, you know, getting getting out of the way, so that you control the enclaves uh, on the hardware, uh, you control the attestation, and you control the launch. So, uh, hello, I'm Przemek Szymon from Santander. We are part of EA. John, my 
colleague should be on the panel, he's in London now. So let me just give you the motivation. An enterprise has huge IT operation off chain. Like my bank has 140 million users. And if we want to have also operation on chain, whatever, however small, the critical thing is to bridge them. So anything that helps us to bridge on-chain and off-chain operation is a godsend at this point. I, I think that the, the reality nobody has still said anything about is that um, TEs will never be decentralized because decentralization implies that you have a deterministic process and it implies that you wouldn't need a T in the first place. So the, the using a T, using a trusted computing solution and isolating a process, assuming it's safe, is like cheating. It's like saying we, we don't have anything uh, better, we don't have uh, mathematical proof or a consensus model com which is convincing enough. So we need to use the TE because the TE, if, if we assume it works correctly, um, will do you know, whatever we need to do uh, in, in a way which we consider trustworthy. So um, what I think we should avoid doing is relying on a single technology because other than the two um, potential uh, point of failures, let's say, or trust lines we have with SGX, which John has mentioned, um, there is a third one which is in common with everyone, not just with the Intel SGX, with, with any T solution, any hardware-backed solution, which is that we don't have control of the manufacturing process and we will never be able to verify in-house that that chip is actually matching an open hardware spec that we typically don't even have. So in any case, there is a trust line um, on the fact that the T is doing what we assume it's doing. Um, and we'll never be able to verify that. So what we are currently doing to try to overcome that is saying, OK, that's fine. This, this is something that is impossible to, to solve. Um, so let's just use more than one technology so that we know we are trusting Intel. But we, we in, in this way, we spread out the trust. And as long as we pick some attestators which um, don't have any interest or any conflict of interest, if they are competing, for example, then the proof you get is stronger. Like if we get the Intel proving something in, then we get Microsoft proving something else, and maybe the same claim, right? And then we have Ledger, and then we have uh, Google, and things like that. You, you understand we have like four players which are competing and have a huge reputation at stake, um, which are claiming the same thing. So does the TE help? Yes, it, it does, but it's not enough. There is always a trust line anyway, so it's not decentralized, and it will never be. OK, great. Um, that was entertaining. So uh, next, next um, question is um, trusted compute. Are there any new, we, we don't like to make a living, right? And uh, is there, are there any new um, business opportunities that emerge because trusted compute now can be used with Ethereum? Marley has the answer to that? <laughs> well, yeah. We were yeah. Well, we think about, you know, I think it will enable uh, the, the ability to create them. Um, so, you know, Microsoft will try to build the platform to make it possible to create the killer application. Um, uh, so, you know, I, the, the, the thing is, is when you start to lay these layers of infrastructure, you, you start to, like, we we're just mentioning uh, you need to uh, trust in depth, security in depth, and you're going to have layers of this trust. So we're going to have single points of failure in places. And um, uh, the good news is we're, we're progressing in that that direction. Uh, but while that's going on, people do need to make money, um, and you need to be able to build solutions rapidly uh, and get them to market, um, and also do it uh, cost effectively. Um, so you know, as we go around and, and start telling customers about you know, what we're trying to do uh, with a platform. Uh, we're not trying to compete with anyone. We're trying to lay the groundwork because we think this is super exciting. Um, uh, from, from an application standpoint, we honestly don't know. We've heard so many ideas, and sometimes I can't share some of them, uh, that we have uh, active customers in development building uh, applications that are intended to make lots of money. So I'm just saying, not necessarily cryptocurrency, but that will come as well. <laughs> yeah, if I can add on this, um, Oracle IS has been currently serving approximately 1 million uh, paid requests asking for TEE backed data. Um, so there is like an opportunity to make money here. 
especially because these uh, T, these, these actual physical devices, they are not something easy to find at the moment, at least, in the cloud, other than IntelliSGX. checks. Um, if we assume we will want to use more than one, some of those are not even designed to be used in the cloud yet. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that at, at least for the next two or three years, there is definitely this opportunity, and then other opportunities will arise once this, uh, like, um, market will scale up, and we actually see where, where it will be going, <laughs> exactly. So I think um, there's an interesting conundrum on the um, for the for um, a trusted compute enablers. If you look at the AI space, right, um, the biggest enabler of AI applications nowadays is Hortonworks Cloud Cloudera. They're what three billion in, in market value, right? The AI application providers, what like three trillion. In market value, so we're looking at like a thousand x, right? Difference. Um, so enablers. So that what what Marley kind of alluded to is like, yeah, you need the security down the stack, right? But the security down the stack ain't gonna make you money in the traditional way, right? So the interesting question is, can we come up with um, novel collaborative? Um, business models that allow revenue share that combines players across the stack. So from the enabler infrastructure all the way to the application um, and distributor level that you can create novel solutions that solve currently intractable problems that are high value for the end consumer and that they're willing to pay for and therefore everybody gets a, um, um, gets a cut um, so rather than having the ones down there be a thousand x lower than the ones up there, you spread the wealth um, a little bit and incentivize, therefore, right, um, collaboration because there's there's more to to um, go around. Uh, okay, my next question is, what does trusted compute allow Ethereum to do that it can't already do? If we look on mainnet at the actual, you know, re real, I mean, beyond the, the hype, if we look at the concrete use cases of smart contracts today, you have a big chunk, which is decentralized exchanges, which typically don't need an oracle in most cases. Uh, so they don't need any external data or any TE supported data. Um, and then you see gaming and gambling. Uh, those ones typically do need uh, something like that. So uh, I think the, the biggest use case in production on the public chain today is providing randomness, uh, like generating some external randomness which where miners uh, will not be able to collude uh, with that. Um, there are others like price feeds or like insurance products, many others like we have seen a bunch. Um, but it, it, this, is still, this is still having a limited traction. On testnet, there is much more variance. On private chains, I'm sure other people on the panel here will be able to share their experience. Uh, there are so many different use cases. But the reality is that it depends on the context. And randomness is something huge on the Ethereum mainnet, on the public chain, while it's probably something really small or negligible on uh, consortium chains. So. I have a comment. It's somehow related, but it's about uh, that we keep the... Um, some good view on, on, on how much we can really get from those various T technologies versus how much we should be reserved about them. Because we all talk here about all cool use cases, how it solves all the problem. We treat those SGX enclaves or other enclaves as magical black boxes protecting our payloads. But in reality, we always should know that they can only offer limited protection and for example, I quickly looked at the uh, EAA uh, 05 spec uh, this morning. And at no point there was explicitly stated that we should always probably give some time limit on the longevity of secrets that our enclaves process. And uh, because of various things, because there are attacks like foreshadow, but also because there are, and there will always be side channels, which means that we cannot be so so excited about using it for just protecting any kind of secrets 
but more likely only very short-lived secrets, which will likely limit the amount of usable applications quite significantly. I don't know, I haven't seen a Faraday cage in a, in a Microsoft data center yet, but, you know. Let me come on, let me come what? <laughs> what, you, 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 you made a successful side channel attack in a Starbucks? Yeah or no? No. All right. Now let me comment this. So you mocked my my angry argument because saying that there is no uh, cages in in data centers, but data centers running by somehow perhaps willing to trust Microsoft slightly more than just a random person running some Ethereum node. It's a node. Okay, running by whoever, and we, so we should be very cautious about trusting this whatever node, a SGX node, because this is not just as it's not like the cage. Okay, it's it can maybe protect us for maybe five minutes, maybe five hours, our secrets, maybe five weeks. I don't know. That's probably we need some kind of metric to to do that so that our applications can be designed in, way, in a way taking this into account. So that's why you need to try to hack a, a, a T at Starbucks to, to see what it takes, so, such that you can actually give those metrics. You need to run experiments. So, uh, <clears throat> I just want to say one thing is that, uh, like anything in, uh, anything in software, uh, it is, uh, uh, till it's not broken, it's not, uh, you know, uh, at some point in time, it, everything will be broken. And even when we talk about this whole, uh, uh, you know, crypto economics based uh, uh, solutions, they also have their parameters between which they work and beyond which they start to fail. Uh, <clears throat> you know, how much should I have at stake and how much should I get uh, penalized and things like that. So the, uh, the point I want to make is like, there is no one solution that is a silver bullet for uh, everything uh, out there. Uh, depending upon the use case, it is a mix uh, of a solution. You could uh, think of uh, a T-based uh, T combined with some kind of a crypto and economics. So there, there are these kinds of permutation combinations that we have to think and uh, always think about, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, defense in depth and uh, not have one point of uh, failure. Anyways, that's not a good design in general. So. Uh, uh, T's have a role to play in there, but uh, knowing uh, where you uh, where you should apply them and when you should be basically have an alternative is part of the system design. I'll just echo one last thing. That was a good point on the time. Uh, limit of the secrets. Um, so that's the the thing is as we start to do these things, no system is riskless. Um, uh, risk tolerances, you live with it. Everybody knows how to do this. If you had zero risk tolerance, you would get a bed. Any, you, know, you wouldn't use a toothbrush, especially an electric toothbrush. You wouldn't use an electric razor. You wouldn't use a razor at all because you cut yourself, right? So, But it's a continuous thing, and you're pointing out a great um, attack vector that we probably didn't think about was how long should we let these secrets survive? I mean, we at Microsoft, we rotate keys how many Microsoft, anybody else left in the room from Microsoft? You have to rotate your keys all the time, and it is painful. I mean, it's like when we have to rotate, rotate our keys on our systems, we have to prepare for two weeks. I mean, we get it down to a rocket science almost. I mean, a process where you can't just hit a button. Uh, but when we add the TEs in, it gets even more complex, especially with, we talk about blockchain keys. So we really need... Um, and the EEA, and that's the, the greatness of, uh, well, the benefit of the open standards is we put some sunlight on these things, and we're going to get great feedback from collaborators that really sort of been there, done that, and know, you know, you might not know, there might not be an attack vector for it now, but who knows, there might be a long-lived, patient, uh, patiently planned attack vector that will, um, if you have too long of a life of your secret, uh, it will be a ticking time bomb. Okay, last question. What should we add to the next release of the trusted execution, trusted compute spec? 
Okay, that's that's the question about. Um, How about it? I, what I would like to see in the next SGX pack, just to clarify. Um, so, the centralized remote at the station, just nothing fancy. Just do it like 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 we had with TCGTPM. The old times, everybody could locally verify the quote for TTPM. That's really easy. You can do that. Um, second thing, uh, make the claims about what trade-offs a flexible launch control will uh, will imply. For example, will I still be able to use Intel Squatting Enclave while having my custom launch enclave? Uh, nowhere in the spec this is explicitly written, will it work or not? I would like to know that. Because if by using my custom launch enclave, which will not force me to have a legal contract with Intel to start my own enclave, so if having my custom launch enclave will require me not to be, will prevent me from using Intel squatting enclave, then it's all meaningless, unfortunately. Uh, second uh, or third uh, is increased memory for enclaves. In Golem, where we want to run lots of payloads, lots of, lots of complex payloads, we already run, for example, we can run Blender in, in enclaves. It runs pretty well. However, if the scenes goes really large, the problem of swapping memory to DRAM really hits the performance. So ideally, we could have that the operator of a node could have a slider how much of the DRAM should be devoted to EPC, the enclave uh, um, total uh, memory. And finally, it would be nice if you also provided some secure paths to devices in general, not just to Intel integrated graphics, which I know you already have, as, as, as the ledger presentation told us. Unfortunately, I never found a public spec that, that would be allow others to use it. But we would like just to any device, especially to more advanced uh, uh, GPUs uh, that uh, implement CUDA, so we could allow people to use or to rent a GPU power for computations. So those four things. Liberate IIS, the centralized remote attestation point, um, specify what are the conditions for, for custom launch enclaves, increase memory, and secure path to devices. Just four things. I'm slightly confused. Were you, was your question around the, the API spec? or? Okay, okay, so I was like, what? Um, yeah. No, no, I know. It's like it's like it's your it's your it's your wish list for for Intel. I think Sanjay heard you loud and loud and loud and clear. And, and it's 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 his new KPIs for next year, right? Um, uh, action items. Yeah, no, I'll 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 talk to your boss about that one. Um, I I I think for the for the spec, I, I think as far as an API spec goes, is, is we we need to add a few more specifics that are. Um, directly related to zk proofs and MPC, um, sort of like more that are that are uh, that are more specific around that as we have currently for for uh, uh, TE, even though it's just for one for SGX. We, that's next iteration that I think we should add. Um, I think what we need to do in the working group is um, a best practice uh, document around um, how to how to create and deploy trusted. Compute um, whether that is is so so if I want to if I want to create a zk snark uh, um, compute service right what are the steps that I need to follow what are best practices if I want to do it for a te how would I if I want to virtualize that what do I need to do right so these are I think that is is beyond the API spec is really starting to talk about what are best practices what do we need to do how can we um, um, implement zk zk snarks effectively. What are the, the the best practices for the for the for the type of, of, of RES to be used, et cetera, et cetera? I think that's that is the next big workload for us. Um, I, I think there are two main pieces uh, that uh, I would like to see in the spec. Um, one is uh, better. Uh, it was already mentioned by Sanjay, I think. Um, a better compatibility and cost uh, efficiency um, with, when we apply that API on the public chain, because right now it will be super expensive. And in practice, it doesn't really make it viable for the public chain. Um, so I would like to uh, like have or so, so either some kind of variation, uh, which works better for the public chain, like a minimal set of features or something, um, or just a new iteration of the spec, which is uh, more cost efficient there. 
Um, and the second thing is uh, like trying to understand uh, better if the current spec is um, as uh, IntelliJ agnostic as it could be, because I know that there are already it's already quite agnostic. In some parts it says it could be something different than IntelliJ GX, you have to specify it like this, and so on. Um, however, um, we, we have already mentioned like Open Enclave SDK, for example, and also Google is working on a silo, so there are those two projects, and uh, that are pretty much both trying to abstract out the Enclave specific logic. I would like also to understand um, if the existing API in this spec uh, would work well with either one or the other or both. So, so yeah, uh, I think that was one of the purposes of this whole thing is like, you know, it, uh, it's at point 0.5 for a reason. So we want it to get out the stake, uh, get, uh, get start, uh, put something out there so that people can react to, provide input, and uh, uh, create something that we as a community feel that it meets our needs. Uh, and, uh, and what I would say is that uh, uh, it would be great, uh, you know, there are a few of us who were, uh, you know, pushing the spec till now. Uh, more of you can join and we can get all of these perspective in, uh, into the spec and uh, uh, that, that's, that's really the objective. It's, uh, it's not to be specific to a technology but something that the community can use. Okay, thanks very much to the panel and thanks to the audience.